Dear viewers, welcome to the discussions on literature in lit space. First of all, thank you for the encouragement you have given me and I look forward to the continuation of this support and cooperation. A few weeks back we had a look at one of Louis Gluck's poems. Now I think that a close reading of a few of her poems would throw some light on the way she crafts her poems. That then explains why I have selected her poems for today's talk. The Nobel Committee is impressed by what it calls the austere beauty of her verse, which is stripped of poetic embellishments. There is a sort of clinical precision in her articulation of experience. The most conspicuous feature of her poetics is the play of an unusually keen logic on the chaos of experience. Indeed, Louise Klug brings her gift of logical reasoning to bear on most of her poems, which are born of the interplay of logic and experience. The effect of understatement, deflation or austerity is a consequence of this kind of reasoning. Look for example at this description of her father's treatment of the mother. She was buoyant by nature, she wanted to travel, go to the theatre, go to museums. He on the other hand was fond of lying in his couch with the times over his face. The lines I would like you to consider portray the death of this man. I shall quote, so that death when it came wouldn't seem a significant change. Unquote. Despite the bitterness of her earlier lines, she doesn't mean to be cruel to her father. It's a playful, logical perception of her similarity. It is the sportive reasoning that helps her cope with difficult situations. Yet there are times when the cutting razor of logic fails to comfort her. Towards the end of this detour, we will examine a couple of these poems. And then we will pass on to a discussion of one of Robert Frost's poems, which also deal with serious puzzles. One of the poems that exemplify Gluck's aesthetics of rationalism is Mock Orange. Several streams of English poetic tradition converge here. What is least expected and what informs this work as a whole is the allegiance to the metaphysical tradition, the sort of what's called violent juxtaposition of dissimilar things. I shall introduce the poem first. It opens somewhat abruptly in a tone of fury and impatience. It's as though the speaker is trying to disprove someone. The lines are reminiscent of Tan's canonization. For God's sake, hold your tongue. This is how Mark Orange begins. It's not the moon, I tell you. It is these flowers lighting the air. The speaker is obviously incensed. What enrages her is the whole yard being irradiated by the Mark Orange flowers. By the way, Mark Oranges, as the name indicates, only look like oranges and are inedible. But why should this floral illumination spark of such an outburst? I hate them as I hate sex, continues the speaker. Here is where we find the likeness between the metaphysical and Louis Gluck. What is it that unites her feelings of revulsion against sex and her repugnance towards the flowers? Both are things of illusion. Mark Oranges remind her of the falsehood of the notion of union in the sexual act. The premise of union or oneness doesn't happen and the entire process becomes an act of mockery. Before we proceed further, a couple of words on the metaphysical dimension of the work. The speaker is overcome by mixed feelings of hate and anger. Yet she makes use of ratiocination to link up the image of flowers with sex. Perhaps. This kind of reasoning helps her to control the rising emotions. In the drowned children on which I did a video lecture in Malayalam, she placed down the poignance of the mishap that is overtaken the children by invoking the theory of prenatal existence. See how she engages with the crisis by setting it up against a broader intellectual concern. The opening of this poem is no less dramatic than that of Mock Orange. The poet shocks the reader with the observation. It's natural that they should drown as they don't have understanding. What sounds like carelessness is the result of reasoning. They are still close to the beginning from where they have come trailing clouds of glory. 
Hence, she would like to think of the children as being weightless, blind and incapable of discriminating things. This, she argues, on the strength of the Vaisartian assumption, is the true state of their being. The fact of their drowning, they are lying wrapped up in white clothes and the candles lit by the table side are all unreal. It's folly to shed tears over what is basically unreal. This is how she comes to grips with the gruesome tragedy. The opening lines of Mark Corinth are so effective because also of an indirect evocation by contrast of the image of the flowers in beds of daffodils. Who can forget that sea of gold and daffodils? In Gluck's poem, the sight of the flowers produces a violent fit of rage in the speaker. Let's come back to the illusion of oneness. Despite her mouth being sealed, a cry escapes her each time they come together, certainly asking for oneness. This is humiliating, demeaning, as it's sure to remain unfulfilled. The entreaty and the response to it are fused for a while, producing the illusion of union. We observe that this poem is the site of confluence of different traditions. Mock Orange, for instance, partakes of the character of confessional poetry. There is, no doubt, an explicit discussion of what seem to be deeply personal experiences. But the cool logic she brings to bear on the analysis of the experience casts a doubt on their autobiographical origin. We will look into another poem to see what love means to her. This poem about a widowed mother who needs cows for her children opens with a rather general statement. There is always something to be made of pain. When we look for what this something is that's born of her pain, it's nothing more than scarves in every shade of red, made for the children to wear at Christmas. Scarves that will keep them warm. There is a wry humor here of the black kind, as though pain is an indispensable prerequisite for a mother to knit scarves for her children. She married many times, keeping her children with her. How could it work, she asks, when all these years she stored her widowed heart. Stored, that is, with love, as though she expected the dead to come back. The last three lines sum up her argument. No wonder you are the way you are, afraid of blood. Your women like one brickful after another. At the beginning of the poem, you represent the mother's children. But at the close of the poem, in the line cited, the pronoun enlarges in scope to imply the readers of men in general. Red scarves are gleefully accepted, although blood, which is life and therefore love, with the burden of responsibilities implicit in it, is feared and avoided. That's how women become walls of brick, and no one is bothered by what lies on the other side. Now, not how red scarves lead to blood and walls of brick. I've said that there are poems which defy her logic. In the Wild Diaries, which won the Pulitzer Prize, there is a sequence of poems called Matin's Poems. In these poems, the speaker is confronted with the riddles of life and addresses God. In one of them, titled Matin's Voice, is the deep anguish of existence. The speaker appears to be reading the garden. As a matter of fact, it's a pretense. She is looking for some signs, some providential signs regarding meaning and purpose. Some symbolic suggestions in the leaves. She despairs of ever being guided with a clue. Summer will soon end. The leaves will dry up and wither. The sick ones turning yellow and falling off first. With dark birds hovering over and singing the music of curfew. She asks in despair at the close of the poem, or oh, was the point always to continue without a sign? God replies to her query, You have no faith in your own language, so you invest authority in signs which you cannot read with any accuracy. The speaker has to go on with her quest for insight into the naughty problems of existence. The discussion of aesthetics and the contemplation on spiritual puzzles takes us to Robert Frost's poem, where the correlation between technique and theme is extremely subtle. Frost is a great craftsman, and his images and symbols are never obtrusive. 
they are manipulated so cleverly this poem titled after apple picking is a favorite with the makers of anthologies for university students hence paying it a little attention is in place here let's first see what the poem tells us the speaker who is a farmer growing apples has had a plentiful harvest we learn that he has been picking apples all day long now he is physically drained and is done with the work the ladder is still leaning against the tree and there is a half full barrel beside it the farmer wistfully notices that here and there on some of the boughs a few apples remain to be picked it is tempting but he is too fatigued to exert himself winter has set in and together with the lingering scent of apples has heightened the sense of lethargy at this stage the speaker proceeds to relate an incident that occurred in the morning he had taken a thin sheet of ice floating in the drinking trough and looked at the landscape through it it produced a strangeness in the eyes and his not yet left what he had seen was a stretch of hoary grass it's another indication of winter he had let it fall and break when it started melting this incident chimes in with the gentle tone of the poem first it serves to deepen the impression of winter secondly in its own way this act of perceiving things through the sheet of ice induces that sense of languor leading to sleep i was well on my way to sleep before it broke that is the lethargy the farmer speaks about is not wholly the result of physical exertion now the dream shifts back to the farmer feeling jubilant and buoyant in the wealth of the harvest this peculiar experience of the morning is not yet complete the speaker says what dreams he was going to have in the sleep to which he was drifting the dream he knew beforehand would be about apples apples which would be larger than the real ones they would be of all shades of red appearing to him from many angles stemmed and blossomed this is a dream not rashly anticipated by your wakeful mind but one that is really experienced by your mind in a state of drowsiness now the dream turns in on the speaker himself feeling jubilant and buoyant in the wealth of the harvest in the dream the poet appears to be standing on the ladder he feels the instep of his feet taking at this point the poem shifts back to the present the farmer gives a rational explanation for the care he takes in picking the apples and gently lowering them if they drop to the ground they would be deemed worthless not only that i am overtired i have had a too much apple picking seems to be the resumption of the narrative from where he left it at the beginning of the poem thirdly we may presume that the speaker has climbed off the ladder when he points to it and describes it still leaning against the tree then towards the end of the poem the farmer says what's going to trouble this dream of his sleep is a word that resonates with suggestions and 10 years hence forced to play on the connotative burden of sleep i am referring to this poem stopping by the woods on a snowy evening the prince in hamlet warns himself against the temptations of eternal sleep our dreams may come when and when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause the prince is worried about the concerning and certainty of what awaits the dead what trouble does our speak anticipate in this moment of contentment to answer this we have to consider the structure of the poem the first section is concerned with abundance of fatigue and the effects of winter this is more or less reiterated in the morning spring with this difference the fruits are larger and the various facets of the apples appear in close up the whole process is summed up towards the end of the poem in the dream he talks about caressing the fruits before lifting them down what impression of the speaker do you have not merely of one who is in raptures over the windfall of fortune he is crazily obsessed with the harvest but the wakeful or asleep his mind is singularly preoccupied with the apples to the exclusion of all other concerns concerns that go beyond the picking of apples the speaker hints at them in the opening lines the ladder used for picking the apples points upward to his heaven 
but in his maniacal passion for wealth he doesn't care about that instead he chooses to be tied up to this world of possessions to be flooded over by mundane concerns this is what is likely to trouble his sleep not the long sleep of the woodchuck which is not eternal but the human sleep which is final this poem occurs in north of boston published in 1914 This is a time when force sought to view human relationship against the backdrop of death. The death of a child nearly wrecks a marriage in Homburg. One of the things that the farmer's wife cannot get used to is the way he came back one day after burying their child, saying, "Three foggy mornings and one rainy day will roll the best earth fence a man can build." Is this nonchalance expressive of the harsh realism of the American farmer? However one explains this one can say it is deliberately put on the farmer's remark betrays a deep attachment to to excessive an involvement in his occupation the sort of attachment we've been discussing in the context of our trouble picking in 1924 frost brought out his new hampshire collection that includes a poem we have to look into the title of the poem is for once then something This poem portrays a pastime of the rural folk of New England. The fun is to look over the curb into a well and see its bottom. The position of the speaker is always wrong in relation to the light. He repeatedly fails in his endeavor and is mocked by his friends. His vision fails to go beyond his own reflection in the water. This image in the water looks back at him garlanded with ferns and with clouds drifting around. he looks god like but for once he transcends this image and sees something white at the bottom the water is disturbed then and he loses sight of what he calls truth the barrier to true perception in the poem is excessive absorption in the self let's come back to our poem the farmer briefly hints at a fleeting awareness of the orientation of the whole process of apple picking the word heaven implies as much then it's apples everywhere picking them lowering them to the ground dreaming about them carting them to the cellar bin it's a case of complete loss of the self in material plenitude in the midst of this plethora of details we have a few moments of a different sort of perception the farmer speaks about looking at the landscape through a sheet of ice and he is greeted by a stretch of hoary grass he doesn't give much thought to it it's irksome and leaves a strangeness in the eyes this is also short lived as is the glimpse of something white in the form of poem it stays with him although he ignores it and gloats over the apples so what's going to trouble him in his sleep is this excessive love of things of the world in the winter of his life unmindful of deep spiritual concern Don't forget to subscribe to this channel if you think it's been useful to you. So goodbye and we'll be meeting again with another poem.